So hello everyone, I'm Sofra Wiyap, you can give me a clue to talk about it, uh, my research, my work. I'm a PhD student at the University of uh, Geneva, and in this session you will learn to have to listen to me twice. So my research project is funded by the Swiss National Talent Foundation, and uh, to make it clear, to make it simple, uh, it's about game-based learning in museum context. So, this is a picture I took at the beginning of my thesis uh, at the museum, and what can be seen here are teenagers on their forum in a museum being completely bored. And this convinced myself that there must be something to do in order to make them active learners, active visitors, and active players. And this is what the research project is about. So, the first game has been developed, Jerome, I'm going to talk about it right now, for a nature museum uh, in Sion. And then the second game has been developed, Al 2049, for a museum and food production in Vevey, the element of So, with our game, Geo, we want to understand from our research point of view how a game can help teenagers to develop critical thinking and knowledge about Anthropocene. So, Anthropocene is a new geological epoch characterized by human action, human activities on the planet. This action, all of them, will impact the availability, uh, the availability of natural resources, pollution, climate change, and ultimately biodiversity. Critical thinking, a really important skill, um, is, the, is the ability to, is, sorry, um, is, is the ability to, to decide what to believe or what to do and to evaluate the relevance of available information and to make reasoned decisions. And to understand the Anthropocene, Teenagers must be aware of their own relationship with knowledge, with environment, and since Anthropocene is a really complex topic, a systemic under, under, underesting uh, is needed, as well as critical thinking. So let's talk a little bit about the, the game. So the gameplay or the playful visit can be divided in four main phases. First, the players are welcomed by a uh, welcome and challenged by a museum curator who acts as a game master. Game university is set, and due to bad weather condition, players or visitors will be stuck in a valley and they must survive in the museum. And please also, they must take care of that small tree right there. It's really important. As we are nice, we give them a really useful tool to survive a digital tablet. Divided into teams, they must gather uh, resources to survive. Using their tablet, they can, they can scan the different stuff. Animal. And depending on the choice they make, they will gain resources. They can, for example, hunt, protect, domesticate, or escape from the animals. This action, all of them, will impact the tree of life. So this frantic search for resources will lead to the depletion of that tree that got killed by. And this tree is a metaphor of the quality of the environment. It's here to describe an abstract concept or a difficult concept, such as ecology, and we translate it in a more comprehensive and concrete way by providing analogy such as music, house of a tree. But at this stage, the tree of life is dead. So, game over. But even though players lost, they are given the opportunity to redeem themselves. Players are then called as wildlife experts. They must solve enigma. There is a lot of strange things going on in that museum. They deal with fake news, with rumors, with polemics related to natural environment. As they make their way to the museum, they will discover new areas, they will find clues and elements of answers, or elements of the museum ex exhibition, allowing them to solve the enigma and to complete, and to complete an ecosystem map, which is a really important game mechanics in order to understand all the systematic links between animals and elements of the museum. Once the players have found uh, enough elements of answers, they gather around the museum curators for a debrief. Players discuss their discoveries, their planning experience with the museum curators, the metaphor is explained, and then the discussion focus on the information they, they, they obtain and the criteria to assess those information. And my workload is not limited to being part of the game design team, but I also have to do some, some research. So, that's on a quite complex uh, research method. We design the game and evaluate the way it is being played. So we assess um, its gameplay experience. Once a game was created, we did an a priori analysis. 
allow us to identify contract use between game design and players' expected behavior. This is equivalent to the game as it should be played. Game as it should be played. Then, based on various observation and experimentation, we did an a posteriori analysis in order to answer the following research question. What are the processes that can emerge and distance players from the game experience that was originally intended? By connecting the a priori analysis, we will get to a better understanding of the actual experience of play. So we had to collect data. Uh, what we did that uh, we equipped some of the players, as you can see on our folder, with GoPro camera, and the camera, uh, the, the tablet itself, was recording voice messages. Sometimes players must answer a question, and instead of tweeting, they must record an audio message. And with those data, I did some categorical analysis on the verbatim of what players say and what the players do. And our observation uh, enabled us to identify processes that will shape the playing experience, experience, making it unique and subjective. This is why I call the actualization of players' game experience. So there is a couple of processes that can happen. Continuity, for example, is when players act as expected in their theory analysis. This is good, this is great. It's when players collaborate actively, when they talk about the game and nothing else, it's when they read the available information and they stay together with the result. Of course, there is discontinuity. Uh, discontinuity. It's when players break momentarily away from the expected scenario, expected behavior. Discontinuity occurs when there is misunderstanding of the, of the rules, of specific in-game information, or short-time uh, physical separation from the board. A major discontinuity uh, could be server errors, it happens sometimes, and you know, when the game crash, then the game is broken. Another interesting uh, phenomenon is divergence. divergence. It's the way, the way players process information, even though they are deeply engaged in the game, is um, central for learning. Indeed, it's expected that players should read and learn about the characteristics of different stuffed animals in the museum. A careful reading is expected and needed and should allow them to understand the relationship between the animal and the question uh, of self -fakeness. However, we observe that some teams, not all of them, just collect information without paying uh, attention to the meaning of this information. Which means that they switched the game that was intended to be an investigation game to a quest game. Then there is an um, epistemic obstacle. So, since an um, um, epistemic obstacle is when players appear to be resistant to the idea that there is not necessarily a single solution for a given problem. This is this appears because in the game we have complex problem, ill structured problem, we don't have an open, uh, we don't have a, a closed solution, a unique solution, but an open-ended solution. And we realized that some players were really used to have at school one correct answer. And it's not the game in that kind of uh, thematic such as complex. And then there is unexpected emotion. We were expecting so we were expected um, uh, some frustration. Why frustration? Because um, players always lost during the first phase of the game. The game has been designed in that way that it's impossible to success in the, in the first phase of the game. So we were expecting them to feel frustration. When we ask them through a specific interface in the gameplay, uh, they identify each other. So they were having a good time uh, as a main goal. Some players also were scared. Because uh, when they go downstairs in the museum, there is like a dark room with a beer, and also was sad uh, because all the animals were obviously dead. So that's it for, for the main week. For it's not the main result; it's part of the of my PhD result. And as a conclusion, I will say that Geo this game teaches us that there is no need for competition in such kind of game. We have deliberately removed any competition time game mechanics. Competition is self-created by the players at certain points of the game. And then players realize that their actions are linked to each other and they start to collaborate between each policy. Then, as I say, teenager and such complex problem is still somehow an issue. So we need to create maybe more games that assess this kind of complexity and then players must 
as sort of an illustrative product. Then play is subjective. We have designed a certain kind of game, and then we realize, we realize that players appropriate themselves this kind of game. And not all of them, but <laughs> players don't read. Mm -hmm. It's like, okay, playing is, playing is fun, playing has nothing to do with reading, and uh, as long as, even if there is just a little bit of text, they are not really motivated to read anything. And uh, last, uh, metaphor is, uh, is powerful. To, to engage and to, to introduce knowledge uh, in such um, game as learning physics. So as perspective and lead, I would say that I need to further develop specific indicators, specific process in order to assess the gameplay experience. Uh, I need to model the playful experience considering these processes so it's more a uh, research perspective. The game itself uh, will be will deliver uh, one month and the museum will be completely um, autonomous. Uh, about the, the way to, to use it, which is not always the case in a research project. Uh, sometimes we develop a prototype, we try it a couple of times, we collect data, and then the prototype dies somewhere. Now the museum will really uh, use that uh, game as a museum, uh, as a visit device. So bibliography, and uh, I have a couple of papers that are already published, and uh, one will be published in the International Journal of Theology this autumn, so we are still collecting and um, doing some research about this game. Thank you for your attention. Thank you, Vince. Thank you for some great questions. Uh, I can ask. Yes. So uh, do you, in your research, look at emotion a little differently? Because there could be emotion caused by just the fact that you're in a museum and you're playing a game. And then obviously that would hide the emotions coming from actual game design, which would be hidden because of the fact that you're in a museum playing the game, you know. So how do you prevent like incorrect emotional data from that? So we, we introduce a, a specific interface in order to collect emotion and not all the emotion, but we focus on epistemic emotion. I don't know if you are familiar with this, but there is emotion in the learning context that will be really useful because they will motivate you to go a little bit further in your research, but they are also really tricky emotion because you can then give up. For example, frustration, you just don't know that little thing that you need to know, so it could be a good thing to create frustration in the game, but until a certain point, you fall in boredom. So with the teachers, we, um, so, sorry, it's in, it's in French, but we, we have to, to introduce that drag and drop uh, emotion self control interface. And uh, at three points in the game, for example, when they lost, when they find some um, information that are contradictory, and at the end of the game, they must create uh, this, uh, this, um, this emotion uh, self control process. And for example, um, boredom, we just say that I'm getting bored, or curiosity, uh, I wasn't expecting this. And they just drag and drop, and they can uh, they can add up to two emotions. And here I expected a lot of frustration, and there is not many joyful answers. So this was a, a part of the game. But I think if you want to, uh, to understand the, the, the playful experience, emotion is one aspect of them, and then there is lots of other aspects to to monitor and to check. Does it answer a little bit? Yeah. Other questions? Uh, the first picture you showed were teenagers, which is, seems to be an art museum. Yeah, yeah. And this is a more of a topical museum, so how do you think that would change the design of a game for such a museum? Uh, of course, course, in our project, uh, uh, we have those partners uh, as, uh, as museum. And for sure, uh, an art museum has other um, objectives, uh, another scenography, museography. And it will be quite challenging to create a game for an art museum. Uh, I, I have this paper because it was really at the beginning, and I was, huh, okay, this is how teenagers act in that kind of museum, and there must be something that we can do about. So, how but, do you think you would handle designing a game for an art museum? Yeah, maybe with some AR, uh, when you scan uh, 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 um, an image. Then there is some something that will appear and make also creating links between all those uh, images and add some.
about storytelling, narration, enigmas, so all kinds of playful uh, experience like that. But so far we don't have any resource for that with Anna's syndrome. Maybe she will comment after the next. I know that they did some tried something in the Van Gogh Museum of Van Gogh in Amsterdam, but I don't think it fully worked yet. Mm -hmm. So that's why I was wondering if you looked into it. Okay, cool. Thank you. Any other questions? I think we should go to the next paper. Thank you very much.